Golden Gloves in the Army. This guy is a beast, and uh, I, I'm just absolutely honored to be able to talk to you, my friend, Randy Couture, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Chris Maltzberger. <laughs> You're welcome. Gotta love me some Chris. All right, so the first question, ladies and gentlemen, is brought to you by Simon Black, the gentleman we just saw. <laughs> Randy, I mean, you you have done a little bit of everything in the business, and my, my questions are going to kind of cross a little bit of the variety of time spectrum, etc. I am going to ask you about some recent news and your thoughts on it. Chuck Tito 3. Yeah. Should it happen? I mean, is this... Is this is, is, are they... Is this one of those things that we've seen that is some fighters who just stay in too long? I worry about Chuck because a lot of his last fights were knockouts. What I, are your thoughts? I worry about Chuck as well. Um, but obviously, uh, if the desire is still there for him to compete, we know that there's a long-standing rivalry. They were supposed to have the third fight. Tito pulled out of the third fight because of his back and, and back injury. Rich Franklin stepped up. And, and took his place on fairly short notice. We all know how that fight turned out. It wasn't a great night for Chuck. Might have been a different night if Tio had stayed in there, but that, that's all speculation. You don't know. There's no other way to put it. So how do you... Um, oh, sorry. But again, I, th I think it's, it's really what's in Chuck's heart. And I know the fans will enjoy seeing that fight. Um, uh, on a different note, a different level, it's kind of interesting that Golden Boy is the one that's probably going to promote that fight. And, and why is that interesting and in, uh, in that those two guys are probably going to get closer to a boxer's share of that promotion, of that fight. Uh, right now in mixed martial arts, the fighters are getting up between 13 and 17 percent of the income from any given show, which is ridiculous. Uh, boxers get between 70 and 80 percent of the income that comes in from any one show. That's why boxers get paid the way they get paid. So Conor McGregor made a hundred million dollars off of his one and only boxing match, even though it was an exhibition, because the Ali Act protects boxers from promoters and separates the powers of sanctioning and promotion. In MMA, the one the one and same guy is is the sanctioning body and the promoter, and that's a flaw in our sport, and that's a difference. And so what Tito and Chuck are doing is. Again, like Conor McGregor, shining a light on that flaw. Uh, so that's a whole different reason why. You know, okay, great, they want to fight. They're both. You know, Tito's not exactly a spring chicken. He's had a, a couple of surgeries, both in his back and his neck. Uh, you know, hopefully they, neither one of them need walkers to, to get to the cage. And, and that's funny because like that's called, funny because that's what the, that's what Tito said when when I fought Tito was that a, he came out on Best Damn Sports Show with a walker. So, uh, uh, he had it coming. For that was absolutely hilarious. So, who do you? I mean, what, how do you see that? How do you see that playing out? I mean, it's you know, it's it's really tough. Uh, I honestly can see Tito twice, knocking him out. We we saw it twice <laughs> that that uh, you know Chuck was in his prime when he fought Tito both the other times. He had that unique ability to find that range and use those long levers to land that shot and. Uh, I don't know if we'll see that same Chuck. How long has he been out now? Six, six years? It's been a minute. Yeah. Um, Tito's been active. Tito fought last year. So that leads me to think that you know, if I was a betting man, uh, probably in Tito's favor right now. But You can take him, right? <laughs> you can take him off. No. You can take him off. Yes, you can. So, I mean, you stick with active. Yes, you Cut! Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that take. Let's do it again. So you kind of teased a couple of, of different subjects I want to touch on, and this next question is brought to you by the Superhero Collective. Um, as far as the, the, the Ali Act and um, the rankings anymore, you see back in the, in the, in the day Shale Sonnen losing to Anderson Silva only to talk his way into a light heavyweight fight with John Jones. I, I, I honestly kind of call it the Conor McGregor effect now because yep. it's just creating this... These super fights, you know, Tyron Woodley beats Robbie Lawler, and he immediately calls out super fights. Like, what do you think about the, the lack of implementation of the Ali Act and the, the rankings and almost the belts, almost are not meaningless? Our, but our sport is anti-competitive. Um, if you want to be ranked in the UFC and you want to fight for a UFC title, you're going to have to sign a very, very restrictive, mm -hmm. exclusive contract 
that's going to limit your abilities, that's going to sign away your ancillary rights to the company. That's your name and likeness in a whole bunch of categories. You couldn't make your own action figure. You couldn't write your own book. I don't think you could even do a movie. It's the very similar to the model that the WWE uses. Those guys have to get permission to do that stuff because they've signed away their ancillary rights in that contract. It's not based on merit. That They're going to manipulate the rankings however they want, make the fights that they think the fans want to see that they're going to make them a boatload of money. And it has nothing to do with the merit of the fighters. And uh, that's, in my opinion, that's not competitive and that's not a sport. Do you feel there's any place in it? I mean, you're good friends with Dan Henderson. When he got that fight to fight Michael Bisbing, I was on the fence because that really jumped, that really usurped the whole ranking system. But I would have loved that's to one have seen example, Dan. That's one example of, you know, you mentioned Conor McGregor, you mentioned Chael Sonnen. There's, there's been many, many, many examples where, why, why did the number six ranked guy get the shot at the title? Why did the number four rank, you know, unless two and three opted out and said, you know, said they weren't, wouldn't do it, then that, that just shouldn't happen. It should be based on merit and, and fighting. I don't care if you don't like John Fitch's style or, or you, know, you think he's boring, he's still winning fights and he should get the nod because he's winning fights. And as far as, I mean, you obviously have had a, a bit of a tenuous relationship with the UFC. I mean, you've seen the sport grow and change and evolve. And of course, this question, the next question is brought to you by Enlisted Nine Fight Company. Um, Conor McGregor's recent, I mean, you've seen, you know, people treated a certain way from like bottom rung treated horribly to what we're seeing with Conor McGregor. You know, Paul Daly punches Josh Koscheck at the end of a fight and he's banned from the UFC. You have Conor McGregor catching felonies at, at the, uh, you know, the Barclays Center. What, what are your thoughts on kind of Conor McGregor and his antics and how they're treating him preferentially, preferentially simply because well, he's obviously a cash cow? Well, let's be honest, the Barclays Center fiasco was a, a publicity stunt gone wrong. Uh, Conor McGregor was supposed to show up at the presser. He showed up late. The presser was already over. There would have been security at the presser to keep him in line, to keep him off the stage, to keep him from doing anything too crazy. He showed up late after the presser was over. Everybody was already out in the tunnel and getting on the bus and going in the bus. There's no security back there. So when he, him and his, him and his guys forced their way back in there, there was no restraints. You know, he picked up a hand truck and th literally threw it through a window. Um, it was crazy, uh, but it was a publicity stunt gone wrong. How do you think that's going to impact? I mean, do you see a, a Khabib Connor in Russia? Is the felony going to get knocked down and Dana's kind of going to take, take care of it? Because within 72 hours, Dana went from, I'm ashamed or I'm appalled to like, you know, that's Connor's still my boy type thing. He was involved. Dana? Uh, he, 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 knew, he knew what was going on. He, and see, I was thinking that too. I mean, he trying to do that he was going to bust into the tunnel and throw something through the bus, but. He knew that Connor was showing up, and he knew that Connor was going to create a hoopla and, and do all, you know, it just got out of control. So, you know. So, that, that, I guess that's another kind of question, which is brought to you by Iowa Bison, some fantastic bison. We all had some bison tacos here. I mean, that, that kind of. Uh, Come on, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> What was I saying? What the hell was I saying? Yes. What's that? <laughs> uh, the so, question by Bison was. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I completely lost my train of thought. I forgot exactly what that question was. I'm looking at my thing. Your, your, your. I'll get back to it. Believe me. Your, your toughest fight throughout the UFC. I mean, you've you've been around for a very long time. Who would you consider to be some of your your tougher competitors? Well, they were all tough, and each and every guy you face uh, is tough. Is good at what they do. It, it's problem solving at its finest. They all pose a specific set of problems and you've got to hopefully train and, and find the right the right combination to solve those problems and for that I think you have to respect your opponents. I was never the guy that was going to talk shit. The guy made me do things, made me train hard, made me, made me learn things that I wouldn't have otherwise learned and for that I have to respect him and I was never one to talk shit because okay I'm going to run this guy down and say he's terrible and all these other things and now there's a chance I go out in that fight and I lose. Where does that leave me? I just ran this guy down for the last 10 weeks and said all kinds of crazy stuff about him and then I've gone out there and he, and he bested me on that night. Mm -hmm. It puts a, a bunch of undue pressure on you uh, and, and it just it, you're, you're risking making yourself look pretty silly. You walk out on that limb, somebody's gonna cut it off behind you and it's a long mm -hmm. fall. Uh, so it was just never my style. I was much more in, 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 of the mind to uplift my opponent. Yeah, he's great. 
He's an amazing fighter. Look at the things he's done. I've got my hands full. I've got to figure out how to, how to, how to get, get around this guy and how to win and make him look good because ultimately, you know, you go out and beat him, then that makes you look good. And that's the way it should be, in my opinion. Um, but that was always, always my take on it. You know what you're getting into when you, you know, Tito was the original guy that talked smack and, mm. and, and I knew as soon as we signed that, that fight that that's what it was going to be and I, I prepared for that and it, it, it's a psychological game. He's trying to get me to think about anything other than how I'm going to go out and beat Tito Ortiz. He's trying to make me emotional, trying to make me angry, trying to make me think about all this other stuff instead of tactically and technically how to go out there and win that fight. Thank you. But they were all tough. Mm -hmm. But the toughest one that I had was the first time I fought Pedro Hizzo. That was a brawl. Nice. The first fight my mom went to in person, actually. I broke my nose and I got kicked in the leg about 14 times. I didn't walk right for six weeks after that fight. It was a back and forth battle. Uh, I definitely felt like I won the fight. Some people thought I didn't win the fight, but I went back and analyzed it and, and felt like I won three of the five rounds. He definitely won two of the rounds. Um, it was a tough fight, and I learned a valuable lesson. Uh, I'd never been kicked. Uh, I had trained for my first title fight against Mo Smith. He knew Mo was a kickboxer, and he was going to probably try and kick me. And I had keyed off the second he picked his foot up, I was going to close the distance and take him down. He was vulnerable, and it worked in that fight. Back then, it was different. You did a 15-minute round, then you did two three-minute overtimes if there was no winner. And I managed to take him down in all three of those periods and, and win the fight, control the fight. Uh, and obviously they changed the format. They went to a five-minute round, 10-point plus scoring. If, you know, you're giving a guy, especially a guy that's a good striker, a chance to start at least every round in a neutral position. And that makes him more dangerous. It makes it more exciting, too. I like it. But uh, a guy like Pedro, who's all hips and legs, a great kickboxer, um, you know, he, he was tough. He was, a, he was the first guy that ever kicked me. And, uh, I knew I had to learn. I didn't want to experience that ever again. So I had to go out and figure out. I was fortunate enough to win the decision, but they forced me into an automatic rematch to renew, renew my contract. This is when Dana and company first bought the UFC, the brand. And they had just signed Pedro to a nine-fight deal. It was the biggest deal anybody had ever signed with the new company. And they were sure this young Brazilian was going to beat my old ass bring in the Brazilian fans and the Brazilian crowd, and, and that's why they signed him to an extended deal, and then obviously it didn't go that way. And I've been throwing monkey wrenches in their, in their plans almost from the start, uh, which is one of the reasons why they, they, didn't, they didn't particularly like me. And I think they were always trying to find a way to get rid of me, and I was, I was kind of like the plague. They just couldn't get rid of me. But, but that was definitely the toughest fight I was ever in. Very nice, very nice. Um, this next question is brought to you by NH Firearms, Mr. Michael White and the crew. Um, it, you've seen, obviously, the sport evolve, in, you know, from the very beginning to right now. Do you have what they call the GOAT? Or do you, do you have a greatest of all time? Or do you see anybody right now that, like, really impresses you that you see really? There's a bunch of guys out there that are very impressive. And, and this, what I call the third generation of fighters is they're amazing. I mean, they don't care about belts and all this other stuff or backgrounds. They just want to be well-rounded complete mixed martial artists and they're doing some amazing things tactically and technically, athletically. The science of athletics just continues to grow and get, continue to train smarter and get better. So these athletes are, are doing a great job. They're fun to watch. Uh, I'm a big fan of Michael Chandler and watching him fight Bellator. I just think his gas tank and, and the, the ferocity that he brings to his fights is, fun, is just really fun to watch. Uh, uh, his teammate from Missouri, uh, Tyron Woodley, about as athletic and explosive a guy as I've seen, and I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. Um, but there's, you know, there, there are a ton of great fighters out there right now. Do, do you see? I mean, I mean, people, at one point in time it was Fedor, and now cats like Joe Rogan will say like uh, like John Jones it was somebody, or you know, at one point in time it was Anderson Silva. Do you see a kind of, in your opinion? You know, like, not just like a Mount Rushmore, but he's like one of the greatest. I think the greatest of all time has, to, yourself, be more, has to be more than just what, he, what they did in the cage. And that's why I think as talented as John is, he's just not been able to get out of his own way and stay out of trouble. And I'm sorry, but that, in my opinion, it, it tarnishes his, his legacy as, as one of the most talented or greatest fighters. Uh, 
So I think it takes it at him out of the discussion, in my opinion. I think Dan Anderson is certainly up there and one of the only guys that's you know, won two divisions in pride and, and was an, obviously a, a very close friend, but a great guy, and I loved watching him fight as well. Uh, Chuck, certainly. Uh, you could make a case for Tito. Uh, you know, he's one of, one of the greatest fighters. I think Frank Shamrock was an amazing fighter. And, and great guitar. Because of his... Uh, you know, disagreements with Dana, you know, he's, he's not been put in the Hall of Fame. I don't think he's gotten the recognition from this new generation of fans that we now have. They don't, they don't remember him fighting. It wasn't as popular back then. But uh, he was a pretty amazing fighter. I mean, beat Jeremy Horn. Uh, you know, luckily, that was a great fight. Beat Tito, beat, you know, beat all the top guys for about four years there in, in the division. So, uh, but there you can make a case for a whole bunch of guys and so much of that is opinion. Uh, which is why it's always fun to talk about. Yeah, it's a very subjective conversation. Everyone has, a, has their own criteria. This next question brought to you by Greg Helfer, LTD private jeweler. Um, I mean, you t t spoke about Michael Chandler, and I'm a huge fan of his as well. You know, coming living from St. Louis, you know, that, I mean, he's, he's an absolute beast, like you said. Bellator, what are your thoughts on Bellator and the growth of Bellator? You know, this heavyweight kind of Grand Prix they got going on. It's, you know, Michael, Michael, uh, Michael Page is absolutely amazing. Yeah. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on, uh, on Bellator? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've always liked Scott Coker. My son Ryan fought for Scott back when, when uh, they were strike force before the UFC bought them out. And uh, uh, Scott's just one of those guys. He's a, he's a lifelong martial artist. He's been doing it. He has a huge respect for the fighters. He's one of those guys you shake his hand and he tells you what, what's gonna, what he's going to do, and that's what he's going to do. He doesn't need a contract. But obviously nowadays contracts are important, but... Uh, I just have a lot of trust in him, and, and I think he has a clear vision. He's doing a lot of these retro fights, you know, the, the Chuck Tito type fights, the Rampage, the Jail Sun and the Vandalay Silva fight, those type of fights that all the fans remember from the heyday and, want, and kind of, they're nostalgic. People want to see that sort of thing. I think Dana's and the UFC's antics have opened up this free agency where fighters are taking their option. They're not renewing their contracts. They're tired of wearing a uniform. And, putting up with a lot of the crap. So when they become a free agent, they're, they're going to, to Bellator, and Bellator's reaping the benefits of that. Um, so I think they're doing a great job. They have a very, very strong brand. Viacom obviously has very deep pockets. They're not going anywhere. They're creating their own content for Paramount, for the network. Uh, it, it's really a pretty good deal, and it gives us one more viable outlet as fighters to, to continue to make a living. Now, they're still using the same flawed model uh, obviously, the UFC is the biggest promotion, the richest promotion in the sport. But you know, PFL, Bellator, all the other promotions are still using that same flawed model. They're still creating their own rankings. Now they're doing a better job of staying true to the merit of those rankings and using that merit uh, most of the time uh, to determine who gets the nod, who gets a title fight. But they're 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 playing the game a little bit too. They want to make things exciting and. Uh, you know, I think that the Grand Prix has been pretty fun. I like the progressive tournament. You get to see a guy compete, and then whether he wins or loses, you get you know. You, there's a lot of a lot of anticipation as guys pro progress down the line. So, I think that's fun. Any thoughts on who who wins that that tournament that Bellator had? Man, I, I, that's what's interesting about it. You know, Chael's uh, a, a little longer in the tooth, but he's as talented as they come. If he shows up, he, he can beat any of those guys. Uh, Mitrione, same thing. It, it's a it's a toss of the dice. When he shows up, he's hell on wheels, and he's really really tough to deal with. He's very athletic. He's a big guy with good power. Fedor, you know, you never know what you're going to get with him either. He's, you know, we just saw him knock out Frank Mir, and that was the best I'd seen Frank Mir look in a long time, going into a fight. Um, you, you just don't know what you're going to get. So, uh, you know, and, and we've you know seen a 185 pounder like Henderson knock him out too. So. You just don't know, uh, and in some ways, that that unpredictability is what I've always loved about MMA, and why that, why those those fights are, are intriguing. They're interesting. Um, I, I just lost the the fourth kid's name for some reason. I think I got hit in the head for a living. King Mo? Or no, he's King Mo. Bader. Bader, that's it. Oh yeah. Bader. And Bader's on fire right now too. And, and probably of all four guys, Bader's probably the youngest, the freshest. The, the you know. Great. Him and Chael aren't bona fide heavyweights, but they they look fine at heavyweight. They're, they're kind of like me, a small heavyweight, but sometimes that can be an advantage. 
I mean, you've obviously been active, you know, I mean, like I said, going back to, to the Army, you know, one of the things it seemed like, and I could be just looking at it from the outside, you never, obviously you had to get in shape in your fights, but you always kind of kept yourself in shape. Is that, speak to us kind of your keys, your, your essential components of longevity as far as your career well, goes. Well, that's a big piece of it. I, I was fortunate, and you know, I didn't start fighting until I was, I was a month away from my 34th birthday, from my first, very first fight. But I've been wrestling for the national team for 16 years and competing year-round and training year-round, trying to, m to make that Olympic team and win that Olympic medal. And uh, So my fitness level was high. I was, like a lot of younger guys, the big peaks and valleys, you're either commiser commiserating or, or celebrating a win you know, at the nationals or, or you're, you know, and, and then you kind of go into party mode and hanging out and not training as hard as you should. And then you got to climb back up for that next tournament. Uh, younger fighters tend to do that. Um, I try to talk to them about, you know, take a week off, great, Re recover, catch your breath, but get back in the gym. That's the time to learn new skills, to learn new tactics, new technique, explore, play with things, have fun doing it because it's supposed to be fun, but don't let yourself get so far out of shape that when it's time to get back in shape again, you got to climb that hill. It, and, and that's when those injuries, you sustain those injuries and things happen. Uh, the higher you keep your fitness level on the long term, the easier it is for those peaks. And those peaks are much higher, so. But this next question is brought to you by Aligned Modern Health. And you know, you've obviously, the fighting career current for, lasts forever. You've been acting, you've been very, very busy. Uh, one of the things I didn't realize that you are training with the Cleveland Browns. How did that start? What's that like, uh, training the Browns? Jay Glazier and I started a company about, about 10 years ago called MMA Athletics. And we started training individual football players in, in my training facility in Las Vegas um, for a couple of years. Uh, Jared Allen, Patrick Willis, Matt Leiner, a bunch of top guys all came through. Uh, and we had, had a profound effect on some of those guys uh, using mixed martial arts as a cross-training tool, especially for football. I've trained some lacrosse players, I've trained some hockey players, even trained a, a baseball pitcher, um, which seems odd, but uh, I think the, the biggest thing is the mental aspect getting these guys to think and train like a fighter and apply that mindset to their sport, whatever their sport is, especially football, because in a lot of ways, football is a combative sport. Now, there's 10 other guys running around out on that field, but you're lining up against a guy every play, and you're keying off that guy. And that guy better have the worst damn game of football he's ever had and never want to play you again, or you're not doing your job. That's kind of the mindset of a fighter. When I walked up in that cage, my job was to break that guy. I don't mean physically break him, I mean psychologically, mentally break him. Push him, make him work harder than he ever worked before or wanted to work and, and make him quit. The Vitor Belfort fight, the first time I, I fought him, I knew if I got my hands on him, there was, there was no way he was going to be able to keep that pace. I wasn't crazy enough to stand around in front of him and wait for him to explode because he was very explosive. But uh, more than anything I hit him with, I think it was just the pace and eight minutes in, he. He broke, he, you could almost hear it. I felt it, I felt the energy go out of him. He quit, he, he broke. And uh, that's kind of that mindset. I learned that in wrestling, I learned that at Oklahoma State. Going out, taking a guy down, letting him up, taking him down, letting him up. And, and then working him over every chance I got uh, until he just didn't want to wrestle anymore. He couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and so psychologically breaking someone down that way is my, it was my goal as a, as a wrestler and a fighter and getting these football players to tap into that, to look through those eyes, and in the fourth quarter, smile at that guy, you know? <laughs> Let him know, you got a lot more. I'm coming again, here we go. And it didn't matter if you beat me on that play or not, you're never gonna know, because I'm still smiling and I'm coming at you again until you're tired of me. You can't scrape me off like a barnacle. Uh, that's gotta be scary to have that. As much as, like, as, much as like, we've, I'm coming. It's gotta be scary. As, as much as we figured out how to incorporate uh, wrestling and, and fighting situations into football, you know, uh, we do a bunch of different drills based on position uh, that are tactical and technical in nature. Making them go three minute goes and five minute goes changes their perception. Especially, I'm a 220 pound guy. You put me up against a 260 pound Clay Matthews and. All of a sudden, I'm knocking him down and pushing him around and got him trapped against the wall, and he can't figure out why he can't get up. Because he's so tired after going three minutes when he's used to going 20 and 30 second goes, 
it changes their perception of what conditioning is and what intensity is. And, uh, and that translates eventually to good football. Wow. That's kind of what we were talking about too with the Leadville. I mean, the level of in the endurance is just like, it's, it's mind blowing. Like Pat talked about with the militant fighting system. He's like, I'd rather kick the shit out of you in the, in the gym than have you be in the third and fourth and fifth round, you know, sucking wind and that's how, how people get hurt. Yeah, that's why I, I love my workout partners because they're the ones that held me accountable. They're the ones that kicked me in the head, you know, molded in fashion and made me work and, and ganged up on me and, and brought the best out in me. Uh, so that on Saturday night it went well and it went easy. All those days in the in the gym in the cage, it's, that's where it's supposed to be hard. So again, uh, you've been you've been obviously super busy. Uh, BJJ dot com or BJJ nine thousand dot com is bringing this next question. Uh, the Expendables, man, awesome movie, awesome franchise of flicks. Who did you link up with on that? I mean, not to talk smack. Who did you kind of get along with and maybe not get well, along? Well, I got with? along with everybody. Okay, cool. Um, Jason. I mean, just just like my. Fight career. I'm not one of those guys. I'm not a terribly adversarial person, which is weird for a guy that gets in a, a cage <laughs> right. and punches people. But I've never been a terrible, terribly adversarial person. So I've, I managed to get along with everybody. But uh, it's just a great group of guys. They're they're fun. Uh, the interesting thing for me is seeing the difference between you take a guy like Mickey Rourke or, or Van Damme that were in the first two movies, and and then you take a guy like Bruce Willis, Schwarzenegger, Stallone. State them guys that have been successful and at the top of their game for over 30 years, and seeing the difference and the different approach of those two types of actors, and, and it becomes very apparent why one group has been very, very successful for a very long time, and why the other guys have kind of had their big ups and downs. Um, but they were all nice guys. I mean, what are they going to do? Be a dick to me? I'll probably punch them in the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're, they're all they're all nice guys. I mean, and we have a lot of fun, we tell a lot of jokes, we, we have fun with each other. It's like being part of your old team, you know, you're suiting up every day and, and going to work and just having a blast. I spent the most time, uh, especially in one and two, with uh, Terry Crews and Dolph Lundgren. Uh, and all those other guys were like mega stars, and me and Terry and Dolph, I feel we're, we're kind of at the same level as actors. and. Happy to be there, happy to be a part of it, but th those were the marquee guys. And so we're watching them do their thing and we're kind of hanging out and, you know, poking fun at each other. It's like, oh, are you ready for that monologue today? And they're like, yeah, we're ready. Because <laughs> you know, we were, you know, it's just how it was. But uh, great group, fun fun to be around. And we're getting to do four. Nice. We're supposed to start filming next year in the middle of the year. So uh, waiting for a script. We don't know what we're doing yet or where we're going and who's, who's getting blown up and who's not. And, all that, so. Well, I've been in SAG for 10 years, champ, and if you need an extra on the set, I'll be more than happy to <laughs> jump in there. <laughs> um, so, something that's been conversated about quite a bit in the in the fight game is a fighters union. What are your thoughts on a fighters union? Well, I'm, I'm the spokesperson for the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association. And here's the debate, and the debate's been going on for a couple of years now. We're not, we don't fit the union model. We're independent contractors. We, we get 1099 by the promotion that we fight for. That's not a union situation. And actually there's, you know, Spearhead, Operation Spearhead with Leslie Smith right now. There was the P, PFL or whatever. There uh, have been three people trying to unionize UFC fighters. Note the difference. UFC fighters, not mixed martial artists. Mm. Mixed martial arts is a sport. UFC is the biggest promotion, brings in about 90% of the revenue in our sport. The other promotions bring in that other 10%. If they get a union of UFC fighters and get recognized for a collective bargaining agreement, that helps fighters that have signed contracts with the UFC uh, and solidifies the UFC's position and monopoly in this of us. That doesn't help the other fighters that are fighting in the sport and all the other promotions. So it's short-sighted and it's a bit selfish, in my opinion. We, we, we need, we are, a, there's very small delineation between a player or fighters association and a union. Uh, you can look up the definitions. It's a lot of minutia and, and very small differences, but there is a difference. And I don't think we want to be a union. I don't want to be an employee of the UFC or any other promotion. I would, I would like to come together as fighters, create an association, use that leverage as a group of fighters to, to get the minimum guarantees and, and some better treatment, some 401k, some health insurance, I think the model that closely resembles what we do is SAG, Screen Actors Guild. 
having being a SAG member and getting my health insurance through SAG, uh, paying my dues, doing doing all the things that I do in SAG. I see that model as some, as one we can emulate. There are all kinds of studios out there making films. They hire people from the Screen Actors Guild. There's all kinds of promotions out there putting on fights. They can hire fighters from from the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association. It's a very similar model, and I think that's the model that fits best for, for what we need. Very interesting. Something, um, this was a kind of an audience question, or a question from Chris, actually. If you were to do like a tag team scenario in the cage, who would you want to be your tag team partner? Um, boy, I think it would be fun to, to be tag team partners with Hendo. I was thinking. <laughs> uh, we trained together forever. We started the sport at the same time, and we used to beat the dog snot out of each other on a daily basis. He was the first guy to ever knock me on my ass, was Dan. And uh, I uh, hit him and, and knocked out his front teeth. He still holds that against me. I don't know why. <laughs> That's a good choice. Dan's a monster. Uh, one last question. I'm going to open it up to, the, to you guys for any Q&A kind of thing. Um, your foundation. Talk to us a little bit about the foundation that you have. Uh, I've been running the Extreme Couture GI Foundation for 10 years. Obviously, uh, most of you know that I, I wore the uniform from 1982 to 1988, the United States Army. Um, now, 33 years later, uh, after being a professional fighter for 14 years, I've gotten a chance to give back to those guys, especially since 9-11, that are making significant sacrifices for us and our way of life. And, uh, I went to Iraq in 06, spent 12 days on the ground there with Rich Franklin, visiting the guys at, at five different fobs and seeing the way they were living and their jobs and what they were doing and hanging out in the gym. Actually, two of the fobs actually had mats. We got to roll the mats out and, and wrestle with the guys. It was a blast. It was, it was a really interesting trip. Uh, and then a year later in, in 07, and I got to go out to uh, Walter Reed and Bethesda in DC. Uh, uh, the Fisher House is there. They take care of a lot of the caregivers, moms and wives that come down and their, their husbands or loved ones are going through surgeries and getting fitted for prosthetics. And so we did a big barbecue at the Fisher House. Me, Don Fry, uh, Ken Shamrock were, were all there. And, and uh, we got to go through the wards and meet a bunch of the guys fresh off the battlefield, uh, you know, wounded. The crazy stories of the financial burden and the financial holes that these guys were were in that was adding just adding stress to their lives and adding issues to them. I decided at that point I wanted to create a, a foundation, a 501c3, to raise some money and some awareness, but some money to uh, help take off some of that financial burden for those guys that are in the hospital and in transition. So we started the Extreme Couture GI Foundation. We're coming off the best year that we've had in the 10 years I've been running the foundation. Uh, we got to sit down in January. I go out every January to the hospital. The staff at the hospital helps me identify families that are struggling the most. And um, I raised $160,000 last year. I got to sit down with 16 families and write a $10,000 check to each one of those families. And, so. Well, I mean, honestly, sir, I could probably sit here and talk a year off forever and hear some stories. Not but these years. Yeah. <laughs> It has been an absolute pleasure, and I want to open it up. Actually, I'm, I'm going to pass the mic because the sound is going into the camera. Anybody got questions for the chat? I'm just going to go up front here. Mr. Sean Lennon, how you doing, brother? Uh, Randy, my question for you, man, is I got two questions for you. So the first one is, what's one guy that you felt you were most excited to fight, or what's one guy you were least excited to fight? Um, I, was, I was pretty damn excited uh, to fight Tito. Uh, I, I knew what I was in for. I knew it was going to be a shit show. Um, but I just, I felt like, it, and I said this in the interview, is it, it, it's going to boil down to wrestling. And I'm, I'm a way more accomplished, way better wrestler. And he's like, this ain't a wrestling match. This is, I mean, he said all the things he said. But I just was really excited about, about fighting Tito. Uh, you know, he was 29 years old. I was, I was 40, 42. Uh, it was just one of those matchups that... And, and the guy I had the most trepidation about fighting and, and just kind of had to literally make friends with the potential outcome was Chuck, the fight right before that. I watched all the footage, and I'm like, this some bitch, is just, he just knocks people out. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, all right, if that's what happens, that will happen. But I'm, I'm not going to, I watched everybody else kind of stand around. They were a little intimidated to kind of engage with him, and that allowed him 
to find that range, to, to stand there and plant his feet and to almost dare you to, to come in. And, uh, and I'm like, you know what the hell with that? If he's able to knock me out, he's able to knock me out. But I'm, I'm hitting that son of a bitch. And so I practiced that, over, you know, head fake, make him think I was going to shoot and, and come with that overhand right. And, and that, that kept him off balance in, in that first fight. And you notice the difference in the first versus the second and third fights. He made a big change in, in his, his tactics. He started moving his feet way more. He didn't just plant his feet, and kind of stand there and try and time you. Uh, he moved his feet, made it way harder to close the distance and get to him in the second and third fight. It made it more difficult for me. To, to fight him the second and third time, obviously. But that's the only time I've ever been knocked out, was Chuck, the second fight. And that was one of the few times I, I kind of got pissed off in a fight. Uh, I'd watched and heard guys complaining that he was poking them in the eyes. Tito had complained, oh, he poked me in the eye. Vernon White, oh, he poked me in the eye. He keeps his thumb out when he throws his, his punch and he, and he poked me in the eye. And I, I literally watched it on tape. And then I was just coming off the Rico Rodriguez fracture in my eye and I ended up getting poked in the eye in, in the second round. And John gave me the time to recover and but I was kind of, I was kind of pissed off about it. It's like you some bitch. And I, and I over aggressively came after him with a big left hook and I missed. And it put me right in the, right in the pocket, right in the perfect shot. And he threw that right hand and it's a weird experience, losing that little piece of time. <laughs> <laughs> One second you're there, the next second you're like, where did you go? <laughs> you know, uh, it's definitely a weird experience. I've been flashed before, but, but never, you know, even in the Brock fight, he flashed me, but the second your butt touches the canvas, you, you're, you're there again. Uh, I just couldn't get out from underneath that big bastard. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question is by Justin. Justin. Uh, Brady, thank you for being here, man. Um, just curious, you know, you're a wrestler, based on what you know. I'm not asking you to bust anybody out by name, but bust them out by for, name. Uh, <laughs> I, I've seen some high-level ground guys, you know, uh, Big Country, Roy Nelson, Damian Maya, Jacare. Seems like the game plan isn't really to go to the ground for them, despite what they know. Uh -huh. Do you feel as though there's pressure coming from upper management to encourage standing up? Or is, are these guys just so good at shutting down, closing the gap, that that's just how it turns out? I, I, I believe there is, there is some, uh, look at the guys that get rewarded. Uh, you know, get, even if they lose fights, they get, look at Phil Baroni. You, know, you knew he was gonna stand and go toe to toe. Uh, management, certainly in the UFC, thinks that's exciting. And, and they'll bring guys like that back, even if they lose fights. Uh, so I, it's, it's not anything that was ever verbalized, but. If you look at guys that are rewarded for fighting a particular way, you know, look what happened with Fitch. Uh, why did, uh, and, and again, the other kid from Missouri that's never even gotten a, he fights in one FC because Dana would never even give him a chance because he doesn't like his style because they're ben more Askren. grab, Ben Askren, that's who I'm picking up. You know, wh why did Ben never get a shake to even try the UFC because, and, and guys like that are, are cut, guys like that are overlooked, guys like that are, are and, so there's, it, although it's not verbal, there is a clear message being sent. And uh, you know, I think that's, you know, Jacques Ray, I mean, first of all, he's an amazing, amazing athlete. Having grappled with him, he's an amazing athlete. Uh, um, but that's, that's a clear message, nonverbal message that's, uh, that's being sent, for sure. Thank you very much. Next question by Julian. Um, yeah, I guess uh, two part. Um, what is your philosophy on ground and pound? I know you're like the master of like being in half guard and like beating him up. And then what do you think of Habib and what he's doing? Uh, I like it. Yeah, it it's it's right in my wheelhouse for sure. <laughs> um, I always, you know, obviously realized very quickly on that I had to improve my striking. I had to I had to try and learn, especially when they you know, my second show they wanted me to fight Vitor and. So I went right out and started training in boxing and kickboxing, and that was fun to me. I was learning all these new, sk new skills. I felt like a kid in a candy store. Uh, and then figuring out how to twist wrestling and, and, and apply wrestling situations and positions and technique to fighting situations was, was again, intriguing and fun for me. Um, but ground and pound kind of grew out of that. I, I knew I could reasonably sure I could take just about everybody down 
I knew the first time I ran into another high-level wrestler, it was going to be an interesting matchup, and it certainly was. I ran into Kevin Randleman, you know, and, and clearly lost the first two rounds. He took me down, and, but I'd spent enough time learning jiu-jitsu and learning the guard and half guard and to survive those two rounds. And then in the third round, I took him down. Difference in the fight. He hadn't spent any time there, and, and did the dying cockroach, and that was pretty much the end of the fight. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think learning how to float wrestlers, especially collegiate wrestlers, are really, really good at floating over somebody and keeping that pressure on them and not resting anything on the mat. Everything's resting on your opponent. I'm finding ways to hang on and dig in to my opponent. The only thing that's touching the mat are my toes, and that's to keep driving, to keep that forward pressure going. Uh, and then from there, posture, learning learning to posture. At first, when you start grappling and doing jiu-jitsu, you're scared. You don't want that guy to get back up. So you stay down there nose to nose where you know you can hold them down. But as, as I got better at it and more comfortable and confident with that, my ability to outscramble and, and float over guys, I, I realized if I wanted to do any damage, I needed to posture up. I needed to get my hips in, keep that pressure on them, but get my head up. Now I, you, know, you can do 50 of these and you're, you're going to smile at me. It's not going to hurt. If I posture up and I drill you with three big, you know, find holes and trap trap you and land three big shots, I'm going to have your undivided attention. You're going to go fetal because it doesn't, you know, those hurt. And so that was kind of what we, we, you know, cage tactics, stacking guys into the fence, like the first, the first Pedro fight. And that was the first time I'd ever punched myself out. I had him stacked into that fence and, and you know, a minute left in the round and I was just wailing away on him. And I could hear John chattering, saying, get out of there, Pedro, you better get out of there, Pedro, thinking, and you know, giving me a verbal cue that he's getting ready to step in and stop this. And then the clock ran out. And I just shot everything I had. And, and the time ran out. And uh, so, but, you know, I think that, that learning and developing those skills and those tactics to take advantage of that ability as a good collegiate wrestler was, was where that, and, you know, Coleman was the first one to coin the phrase. Ground and pound, that's my goddamn game. Uh, that was my first UFC, I'll never forget that interview. I shared a locker with him uh, at that show. He wasn't fighting, he was cornering Royce Alger. And Royce fought, and it was the uh, first lightweight tournament. So Tito was an alternate. Royce fought Ensign Inouye in the first round. And Royce won the fight, but he, he fractured his, his orbit. Or uh, not Royce, uh, Ensign won the fight. But Royce hit him so hard, he fractured his orbit, and he couldn't continue, which is what put Tito in that final match with Guy Metzger and started the whole Shamrock-Metzger uh, rivalry um, at that show. But we're, you know, showing up at the arena four hours early before the shows even start. And we're in this locker room, and so I'm like, man, I got four hours. I'm laying down, putting a towel over my eyes and going to sleep. I'm going to sleep get some rest. All of a sudden I get woke up out of a sound sleep to screaming and yelling and somebody bashing their skull into a locker. And I'm like, what the is going on? I roll over and look, and it, here's Coleman, <laughs> two and a half hours from fight time still, smashing his head into the locker, screaming at Alger, trying to get, I'm like, you guys know we ain't fighting for two hours yet, right? It's a little early to be getting jacked up, ain't it? Right. He was one of a kind. For sure. Next question is by veteran a uh, veteran mixed martial artist himself, A. Wagner. Thank you. Um, so I have it's kind of like a part A and part B, but I suspect the answer is the same. Um, during your talk, you talked about um, consistency among fighters that you didn't know which fighter would show up, and that's a big part of the game. Mm -hmm. And then as a follow-up to that, you were talking about on the expendables, you could tell a big difference between, let's say, the A-level guys and the B-level guys, and it was obvious to you why. Mm -hmm. Can Can you expand on? what made it obvious to you why and also what you think is key to consistency amongst the fighters? Well, I think the difference in the two is different. Uh, in fighters, uh, guys that didn't show up sometimes for, for some reason got in their own head. Uh, I think psychologically somehow they, they let down. We, we already know they have the physical gifts. We've seen them use them when they've showed up. So what got in the way, something got in the way. They, they were doubting themselves or, or saw something uh, that caused them to question their ability in, in that matchup and they, and they didn't show up uh, with the fighters. Um, and, and that would be interesting, you know, not, not getting a chance, well, 
I have gotten a chance to work with Jail, and, and sometimes Jail doesn't show up. Sometimes he looks like an absolute world beater and, and beat anybody in the sport, and other times he just does not show up. And, I, and I know it's, it, it's in, in, its own, in his own mind. You talked about those voices. I, I, it, it's, for me, it's one voice. There's a voice in there. I call him my crazy roommate because uh, he says all kinds of crazy shit that no one would ever say to you, to your face anyway. But learning that, that you control that crazy roommate, that crazy roommate doesn't control you, um, giving it the affirmative, positive things to say, especially when the pressure's on, it's a mental skill. And you have to practice that, to train that. And the more I train it, the easier it becomes. When I first started learning to control that voice, it was through wrestling and working with a sports psychologist in the national team in wrestling. And uh, I had to write down those affirmations and those positive things I wanted to give that voice to say and reiterate them all the time verbally and put them in, in my locker and in my bag and in my mirror by my toothbrush and say them all the time. And pretty soon they become, you know, I don't need the cards anymore at some point. And I can hear when that voice, we all have that voice. You can step behind that voice now and just let it, let it chatter. You have that ability to step behind that. You can see, sit up there and says all kinds of things. And, and, and I, have a choo I get to choose whether I want to engage in that or let him say what he's going to say. It doesn't matter. Or I can say stop and give him those positive things to say that, that keep me on task and keep me in the zone. Um, that's the difference for fighters. For the actors that I was talking about, it, it's the difference in, in lifestyle. Um, and that how serious they are about it, that they treat it like a profession, or you know, are they caught up in the media and, and the hoopla and, and that celebrity thing, uh, that was the biggest difference. Uh, those guys that had those big ups and, ups and downs were all about that, being that celebrity and, and getting caught up and, and more interested in making the money and, and impressing the girls and, and going out and, and doing all that other stuff where Sly and, and those guys, that have, they're, they're just consummate professionals. They're smart, they know their audience, they know what their strengths are, and they are gonna operate and play in that, in that wheelhouse all day long and do it well. They, take it, they treat it like a job, like it, it, it's a profession. And uh, that's the biggest difference that I saw between those two groups. Thank you. You bet. Mike Soto. Mr. Gator, uh, being a two division champion, uh, what do you think of Daniel Cormier's chances against Steve Miocic? I like Daniel's chances. Uh, I'm a big fan of Steve. I think Cowboys. Steve's got a great fight IQ. Obviously, Daniel and I share the Cowboys. He, he was a little after me, but I've gotten the chance to have Daniel in the gym at Extreme Couture in Vegas and uh, talking about fitting those wrestling techniques and tactics into fight situations. He's as good as anybody I've been around. He's amazing. If Daniel has a knock, it's that he's not always as diligent as he should be. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't work as hard. I mean, that's a reason why it's easier for him to be a heavyweight. Doesn't right. have to work as hard. Doesn't have to cut the weight. Doesn't have to. So that's you know that, that can be a bit of an issue and a bit of an Achilles heel for him. Uh, but he's he's perfectly capable of competing at heavyweight. We've seen it already. So that'll be an interesting fight. Um, I like Daniel's chances in that, but he's got his hands full with Steve, for sure. Next question is, oh, well, Chris, Chris Flores. I uh, didn't really have too if much any, of a question. If anybody I'm wants trying to make sure this thing's work, this thing works, <laughs> but uh, really quickly, I guess was, I hope this is a quick answer for you, but where's the best barber shop you've ever been? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shameless promotion. Right shameless, there. shameless, shameless yeah, for sure. Well, let's just, let's, let's. Give everybody a round, of, a round of applause for this facility, this place is awesome. And what they do on a regular basis, from making the suits to, to, to shaving guys. I mean, even even slicked up my eyebrows, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm yeah. I, feel, I feel like the Flash. You know? yeah. No wind resistance at all going on up in here. Yeah. So. Uh, did we also take you out to party last night a little bit? Uh, yeah, time? we did that. Uh, we wound up at Maple and Ash in the wine cellar. Doing shots of tequila in a wine cellar. What the hell is wrong with this picture? Uh, but yeah, it was, it's been a great trip. Thank you guys very much for reaching out to me. It's been a yeah, lot of fun and happy to be here in Chicago. And, and this is a very unique experience. So thank you guys. 
Thanks to all you guys. The, the gun, the gun is absolutely amazing. The, the suits, I mean, they, they don't get much better. And, you know, the necklace, the, the, your sponsors are fantastic and very generous. Yeah, if anybody would like to see any of the jewelry, really, really obviously cool. go see Michael Helf, Helfer over there. He's got jewelry set up. Mike, you got a question? This next question no. is going to be by my partner in crime and the one who owns this facility, Mike Bernson. I really don't have a question. That's all right. Come okay. On, sir. I had to step out for a minute, so did we talk about Brock Lesnar at all tonight yet? Oh, no, I, 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 I sure didn't. Have it? Brock didn't come up yet. It had to be for the money, dude. That guy is ridiculous. He, he has 70 pounds on you. 70 beats. But you were kicking his ass for a while. You no, know, I felt like I was, I was a half a round away from, from I think so. swinging, it, swinging it my way. Uh, I was doing everything I trained to do. What, what made uh, you take that fight? Why not? Why wouldn't I take that fight? Right. I love it. All right. Yeah. Yes. I got to work on my mentality. I got to work on my mentality. Why wouldn't I? My strategy was to make him wrestle me as much as possible, which is what I did in the first round. Uh, it wasn't to stand around and, and try and trade blows with a guy that size. Uh, the thing that you know, I didn't realize uh, in analyzing him is how long he is. He looks so thick. You don't think he's that long. But he's got a crazy reach, and that's ultimately what, what caught me. Is I rolled from that punch, but it just kept coming, and, and this, mm -hmm. it hit me right behind the ear, flashed me, knocked me on my butt. The second I hit the ground, I was awake and started trying to scramble to get out from underneath him, but it just, he came down on top of me, and I just I didn't get out of there. So. Re wrestling him, is he as strong as everybody, like freakishly strong as they say he is? He's, he's a big guy. Uh, he didn't feel freakishly strong. I mean, he's a 290-pound man. Yeah. It's it's how quickly and athletically a guy that size moves. So when you when you move that kind of weight like that, it makes it, it's it's weird. It's different. So it's hard to find partners to simulate and emulate him in the training environment. Find guys that big, but no guys that move that way. So that was that was a challenge. Yeah. That's Mario for being a 250. And want to get back into some of that sort. Uh, uh, UFC, MMA, MMA, boxing. Hey, coming back at forty-five. What's my odds? Odds? I mean, I, it's numbers are just numbers. Do the work. Why are you doing it? Thank you. If you're doing it for a paycheck, you're doing no, it for the wrong reason. I Do it because you love it. Do it because you have a passion and it's what you want to do and it's yeah. the lifestyle you want to lead, then, then get after it. I fought till I was 48. You can't, I mean... George Foreman won the heavyweight title when he was 47. It doesn't, those, those, those are... No, and people are going to tell you you're crazy. Uh, my mom certainly looked at me crazy a couple times, but... Uh, you know, there's no, there are no rules. You've got a heart in that chest. you got a, a physical body that, that, you know, get after it. Next question is by owner and operator of NH Firearms and also military veteran Michael White. Mike White! Well, it's really not a question, it's sort of a voiceless horse because driving up from Alabama yelling at all the Chicago drivers, you know. <laughs> I'm really hoarse, so my apologies, but anywho, uh, I'd like to say first before anything, you know, recognize Mr. Randy as being a veteran. I mean, the 101st of the 18th Air Force Corps. Thank you for the service. Obviously, it's Memorial Day weekend. We know it's the most we lost. But he has done such a great job for our military community, serving, training some of our finest warriors, uh, and so forth. So, nothing but pure respect Thank you. Uh, for you in that aspect. Um, little known fact, he was in a movie called Range 15. That's right. Uh, for those who not, do not know Range 15, we had an opportunity to raise $2.5 million and went out to Hollywood and made a movie. We had an empty vest, played zombies and all this. I mean, in the military world, we think of zombie apocalypse where all oh, hell on wheels, chaos, that we can go shoot free for all, yada, yada. A lot of veterans were just, uh, had amputees and so forth. Ms. Arms were able to use their disabilities to be like zombies and so forth. Well, the beautiful thing is, is Mr. Randy, he played Zombie contour. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It was and, fun. Oh, it was great. And, uh, the seventy-five percent of the cast and crew for that film were all were all vets, and, uh, and they did things a little bit differently. It was it was a fun project to be involved with, and 
was one of those few times where I had to fight with my agent. My agent was like, no, man, you, you shouldn't do this movie. You know, they're not, they're not, you know it's just, it's going to lower, you know, you have to be careful about what kind of movies you do in the industry and, <laughs> and you know, lowering your stock, so to speak. And he, this is one of those movies he felt like was going to lower my stock, his ability to go out and sell me in other motion wow. pictures. And I'm like, no, man, you don't understand. These are my boys. I am doing this fucking movie. I don't care what you say. Uh, I did it. I caught flat from him for it, and I don't care. It was a blast. We had a great time. So all three of agents. Uh, again, like Mr. Rennie said, the fact that he did that, he did great thing for our community, the veteran community. And my question is, uh, how did you prepare to fight Tim Kennedy as a zombie? <laughs> <laughs> you guys haven't seen this film. This scene is just ridiculous. It's so hilarious. And it just, I don't think it was written to go down that way. It just kind of took a life of its own. Me and Tim were having fun grappling. You know, he rips my arm off. I am a zombie. Uh, he rips my arm off um, and starts smacking me with it. Uh, and eventually, we end up in a scramble. He ends up with my back, and he, and he ultimately, he, he rips my head off. Blood everywhere, literally, blood everywhere. And then uh, he uh, takes my head and punts it out of the, uh, out of the ring. Uh, it was just, it was one of those classic scenes. I don't think anybody had a straight face. We were laughing the whole time. It was, it was hilarious. Uh, one of the funniest parts was when we first started filming it, he was supposed to like rip his, his sweatpants off and he had on like a jock with a, with a, with a merkin on it, a, a, a fur merkin. Well, when he rips the sweats off, the merkin comes off too. So he's basically standing there buck naked and he wants to just keep going. I'm like, no, dude, no, you gotta, you gotta put something on. That ain't, that ain't gonna fly. Pretty hilarious. Next question is by Eric in the back. You started late. What pushed you? What drove you? Like to. Well, initially I, I got into the sport because it was intriguing. I saw the application of years of wrestling uh, and an opportunity to be a, a professional athlete. I think being a professional athlete is, is a huge honor in, in our society. So. Getting a chance to, to be a professional athlete was I thought was pretty cool. And it was an intriguing sport. I didn't know how I would do. I didn't know how wrestling was going to fit into all that. But I saw Mark Coleman, Don Fry, Dan Severn, other guys I knew from the wrestling world that were doing really well at it. And I knew the kind of intensity and technical nature that wrestlers bring to just about anything they do. So uh, it was just something I, I wanted to try. And then you know, after that first tournament, it just it took on a life of its own by by my fourth fight, I'm fighting for a world championship. I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> uh, it just, it just, it just happened. So it was, it was never an issue of motivation. It was always, it, it was an extension of wrestling, and I've had a passion for wrestling since I was 10 years old. Also, Randy, I, I do agree with you uh, with Dana White, with Conway or uh, McGregor. He did know about it. So my question is, why doesn't he cater to Khabib, who's never lost a round? And in my opinion, and in my heart, Khabib could destroy Conor McGregor. So why doesn't Dana cater to this guy, to the Russian? Well, first of all, Conor McGregor's making him a whole boatload of money. Second of all, Khabib has that style that, that Dana's not keen on. Dana's a boxing guy. He came from that boxing world. Those guys that are willing to stand and strike, the guys that are willing to fight that way, even if it's not their strength, he, he rewards those guys more. And Khabib is definitely not that guy. Khabib's going to take you down and grind you. That's, he's got a very, very strong grinding style. And that's, that's not a style that Dana's very popular. He doesn't like. He's not very happy with it. Makes sense, man. Thank you. you All right, guys. I think this is our last question. It's going back to Mike Bernson. And no question. I'm going to kind of close it out. But first, I want to thank, give a huge thanks to my partner in this project and really the leader of this project. Mr. Chris Maltzberger, the network, call the network. He puts an immense amount of effort into these things, and it's a labor of love. So thank you, brother. Really appreciate it. Randy, yeah, I can't even express to you how much fun I've had with you and how fucking cool of a guy you are. Salt of the earth to the...
I can't even believe it. So, yeah. I've never met a cooler guy. I've been telling everybody, this is the fucking coolest guy I've ever met in my life. <laughs> this is the coolest guy. <laughs> well, I'm much appreciated. Thank you. You got it, brother. And Jeff, yes, thank you, man. Absolutely. He, uh, if you guys don't know the Conspiracy Farm, or it's me speaking to you, Jeff's podcast. I don't know if you guys know Pat Militich. Tell, uh, tell Pat we wish him well with his vaginitis. <laughs> yes! Yes! Did you hear that, sir? Vaginitis. <laughs> hey, Randy, he was sleepy. Uh, he was sleepy. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, Roasted! But uh, thank you so much to all of our sponsors. Iowa Bison, Align Modern Health, NH Firearms, Simon, who am I missing? Uh, BJJ9000.com, Align Modern Health. Greg Health for Private Jeweler. Yes. Superhero Collective, Enlisted Night Fight Company, and NH Firearms. Also, folks, I do want to thank Randy. Thank yes. you again, sir. Thank you for coming in. Yeah. We're done with the Q&A, guys, but we're real quick. Before you guys